Thank you, Sam. Well, we're going to talk about Thanksgiving in America. We're going to talk about thankfulness to God. We're going to examine thankfulness a little bit. We're going to talk about Thanksgiving, uh, and that's a, a prize project uh, for me. I'm, I'm happy to talk about this subject because the Freedom Project is all about teaching people about our heritage and our history, and that heritage includes thankfulness to God. It includes a godly foundation. In fact, uh, one of our key tenets is that our rights come from God. Now we're going to look at Thanksgiving in America from uh, several different perspectives. Not all Americans see this holiday the same way. A lot of them celebrate it, but a lot of them fail to realize the real roots of Thanksgiving. And I think perhaps even a few of us miss the real roots. Now I'm going to have a little fun here too. I, this is one of my favorite Thanksgiving cartoons. Uh, the, the farmer here, if you notice, he has the, the cane. He's, he, he can't see. And the turkeys, being American turkeys and smart birds, have kind of figured out a way around that. And he's got his hatchet, but he's not having much luck because they're all saying moo. <laughs> and this is one, I, since there's no kids here, I can get away with this today. It's just, I'm not a big fan of Sesame Street. I'm a homeschooler. Uh, so I, I kind of got a kick out of that one uh, was, was going around. So Anyway, uh, to get into the meat of things, uh, here's James W. Baker, senior historian at the Plymouth Plantation, and it is PLI. Uh, and here's what he has to say about Thanksgiving. He said, the reason we have so many myths associated with Thanksgiving is that it's an invented tradition. It doesn't originate in any one event. It's based on the New England Puritan Thanksgiving, which is a religious Thanksgiving, a traditional harvest celebration, which was throughout England and uh, New England, and many other ideas like commemorating the pilgrims. All of these have been gathered together and transformed into something different from the original parts. Now, that is effectively true. Most of that is true. Now, perhaps that's a shock. Perhaps you disagree with part of it. Um, we're going to play a little fact or fiction here for a minute. Uh, how many of you believe Thanksgiving is held on the final Thursday in November? Any? Any? Okay. No, that's, that's a myth, because if there's a fifth Thursday, it's held on the fourth Thursday. So that, that changed a while back. Um, let's, let's try another one. Uh, how many of you believe that uh, our, one of our founders, one of our prominent founders, favored the turkey as a national bird rather than the, the eagle? That's right, and that, that's a result of a letter that he wrote to his uh, daughter, that was Ben Franklin. And uh, I thought it was kind of interesting what he, what he said. He said, uh, let's see here, uh, the turkey is a much more respectable bird and a true original native of America, although it's a little vain and silly, like some Americans, it's a bird of courage. Okay. Um, fact or fiction, Abraham Lincoln first declared the day of Thanksgiving. How many of you believe that? 1863. Okay? Not true. That's fiction. George Washington, John Adams, James Madison, and many other presidents issued proclamations calling for Thanksgiving in America. It was a major event. Uh, George Washington it was in, co in conjunction with the U.S. Constitution, the issuance of the U.S. Constitution, and uh, the end of the War of 1812 in Madison's case. So there were, there were other days when we used to celebrate. Um, how about the uh, Macy's Parade? Uh, you, how many of you believe Macy's originated the Thanksgiving Parade? Okay. Oh, well, this is a sharp bunch. Okay, it was actually Gimbel's, and if you, if you ever watched, what is it, Miracle on 34th Street or something like that, you know. Uh, they, they get into Gimbel's a little bit, but that's, that's a different holiday. Fact or fiction, turkeys are slow-moving birds that lack the ability to fly. How many of you agree with that statement? Okay, well, see, this is a tough audience in Wisconsin. Now, in California, I could get away. I'd get everybody to put their hands up because they haven't got any idea whether a turkey can fly. The only one they ever saw was on the shelf at Safeway. So uh, the, the turkeys are quite good flyers. As a matter of fact, I've had them fly over my head and fly out of trees and fly into trees near me when I've been deer hunting. So that's, that's kind of a fun one. Uh, so, you know, and we all have personal perspectives. Yeah, they are pretty mean birds, too. Uh, they all have personal perspectives. Sounds like you've had a personal experience, sir. Um, I remember, you know, in my memory, I had kind of five major points that, that came up, uh, five perspectives. Um, one of them I called the hand turkey. Now, how many of you remember the, the hand turkey? Okay. 
Um, I remember one of my earliest memories, uh, people with artistic ability were asked to draw deer and pilgrims and Indians and things like that, and people like me were <laughs> tracing their hand. I always thought it was kind of interesting because after the art was all done, you could tell exactly who was right-handed and who was left-handed, you know, like <laughs> look, looking on the wall. But that was an early memory. I remember school parades where we wore pilgrim costumes in remembrance of the pilgrims or the Puritans or, you know, it depends on, you know, where their information came from. Cute, huh? I think this one's Sam Antonio over here. I'm not sure, but uh, I think that's back in the old days. Um, but this, this perspective, um, I'm old enough to remember the slow fading of the real meaning of Thanksgiving. I was not really spiritually aware because I was not a Christian growing up, but I, it was there. It was all around us, mostly unspoken. We realized we were giving thanks to somebody. But much like Christmas, God slowly, slowly kind of faded into the background and disappeared. My family growing up were not Christian, so we didn't really notice it much. It was all about football and the turkey and maybe the Macy's parade and a few other things. And our annual awkward, very short prayer over the meal. A society in Hollywood have certainly done, you know, a lot to <laughs> uh, destroy the meaning of Thanksgiving. But there was a point at which um, I had an awakening. It was kind of a dual awakening for me. It happened at the same time. I became aware of things that were going on politically. I became aware of what was happening to our country. And being patriotic, I had a patriotic awakening, and that was through the John Birch Society. It took a friend of mine a while to get me involved, but I got involved. But at the same time, I also realized there was something missing in my life spiritually. So I went looking for God. And God, thankfully, was looking for me. So I had those two awakenings back in uh, 1982. And it, it was really a, a dual awakening. And what happened was Thanksgiving changed for my family. Um, this, this whole remembrance of Thanksgiving, the way that it was intended, and what, what Thanksgiving really meant, began to flood back to me as I began to study our history and heritage and at the same time to study the Bible and, and to become a knowledgeable Christian. It meant a lot and it had a brand new meaning for me but it was a very very old meaning as I began to study it for my family and I. Now there are about four views I found when I did some research on this. There's an incredible amount of information on, on Thanksgiving out there. There's the modern view which is Turkey Day. How many people have you, you heard say, oh, it's Turkey Day, it's almost Turkey Day. You hear that all the time. Um, there's the radical view, the invaders, murderers, evil, etc. Uh, that, that's one view. The official view, that's you know, Bradford's writings and Washington's proclamation and Lincoln's proclamation and, and the governmental view. And then there's the truth, which I believe is the blessings and the thankfulness that comes with worship of God and with the blessings of God. So... We have the modern view. You know, we have beefy gladiators that chase each other around, uh, revolving around a pigskin in a field in Miami or Dallas or someplace or Detroit. We settle into our living rooms and we loosen our belts and we wave off that second or third piece of pie. And that's kind of Thanksgiving. You know, we groan about how much we've eaten. We're all familiar with that, so I'm not going to waste a lot of time with that. The radical view, um, it's out there, believe me. Uh, the usual suspects, the leftists, the atheists, the agnostics, the immoral, they see the pilgrims in the celebration, the whole celebration, as a bunch of murderers who pillaged and burned and then sat down to have turkey to celebrate their horrors. If you don't believe that, visit the American Indian Movement websites, any of them. There are a number of them. Um, uh, Russell Means says on one website, this is uh, the UAIN website, UAIN, uh, the United American Indians of New England or whatever. He says, quote, after colonial militia returned from murdering all the men, women, and children of all the Indian villages in the area, the governor, governor proclaimed a holiday and a feast to give thanks for the massacre. He then encouraged other colonies to do likewise. In other words, every autumn after the crops are in, everyone went and killed Indians and celebrated the murders with a feast. That's a quote from this, this website. And he called uh, pilgrims equal grave robbing hypocrites. So, you know, we have to be aware that people out there doing that. Now, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that either because it's ludicrous. It's ridiculous. I mean, we know that not everybody who came to this country and not everybody who's lived in this country has been a saint and that people did bad things and there were atrocities. But that's not the flavor of America. That's not the mainstream of America and it wasn't then. 
The official view now is basically most of us feel like William Bradford and the settlers in the early days, they had a dinner with the, the Indians and they gathered in the autumn of 1621 to celebrate the first bountiful harvest in the land of plenty. And that first winter had been kind of harsh and some of the people had died, but the survivors were hardworking and tenacious and um, with the aid of a little agricultural expertise from the local Indians, they were able to move on. The, the Wampalanog, the Narragansett, and the Mohegan. And they thanked the Creator for an abundant harvest, the second uh, autumn in this new land. Now, various presidents have recommended days of thankfulness, and we talked about Lincoln and Washington and some of the others. We'll talk about that more later. But what's the real story? Let me give you a little insight you may not have. The truth about Thanksgiving goes a little bit deeper. We shouldn't s simply accept the whitewashed sort of secular version, watered down and simplified for easy dismissal, or the superficial version that I call Thanksgiving light, that a lot of Christians belong to. That, that they're in that school because they really never looked at this. And it links together the two parts of my change in my view, the political view and the religious. The harvest of 1621, folks, was not bountiful, nor were the colonists hardworking or tenacious. 1621 was a famine year. Many of the colonists were lazy thieves. Now, you know, I'm going to get something thrown at me here, but let me read to you. This is the history of the Plymouth Plantation by the governor of the colony, William Bradford. He reported, quote, The colonists went hungry for years because they refused to work in the fields, preferring instead to steal. Bradford recalled for posterity the colony was riddled with corruption and discontent. The crops were small because much was stolen, both by night and day, and became scarce eatable. The harvest feasts of 1621 and 22 all had their hungry bellies filled, but the relief was short-lived and deaths from illness due to malnutrition, malnutrition continued. That's troubling. When I first found this, I thought, wow, you know, uh, am I wrong? But then something changed. You see, by harvest time 1623, Governor Bradford was reporting that instead of famine now, God gave them plenty, and the face of things had changed to the rejoicing of the hearts of many, for which they blessed God. Thereafter, the first governor wrote, any general want or famine has not been known amongst them to this day. Why, by 1624, was so much food there? What, what, what happened? What changed? Well, this is the Mayflower Compact. Okay, and this is the group and the picture most people associate with it. And it begins, in the name of God, amen. Now, what's the, name of, what's the meaning of the word covenant? It's, it's an agreement between people and God, or between two people, or be, between different entities. It's basically a pact. In this case, it was a pact with God in the name of a bunch of people, and amongst those people, they agreed to something. The problem was they signed this document before disembarking from the Mayflower. It took famine and corruption and death and the end of man's folly and his sin when he attempted to build outside the framework of God without the guidance of God. It wasn't until late 1622, or the low point of the colony, that the pra practical application of the principles of that compact were applied, socially, economically, and spiritually. Up to that point, they basically had socialism. They had everything in common. Let me, let me read something here from Bradford again. Quote, they began to think how they might raise as much corn as they could and obtain a better crop. What decision was decided on? It was simple enough. He simply, quote, gave each household a parcel of land and told them they could keep what they produced or trade it away as they saw fit. What? That wasn't the American way of life to start with? No. The Mayflower Compact had required, quote, all profits and benefits that are got by trade, working, fishing, or any other means to were to be placed in the common stock of the colony, and that all such persons as are of this colony are to have their meat, drink, apparel, and other provisions out of the common stock. That, folks, is socialism. Okay? This, from each according to his ability to each according to his need, was an early form of socialism. That's why the pilgrims were starving. Governor Bradford writes during those terrible first three years, quote, young men that are most able and fit for labor and service complained about being forced to spend their time and strength to work for other men's wives and children. Since the strong, or the man of parts, had no more in division of victuals and clothes than that was the weak, the strong men simply refused to work. The amount of food produced was never enough. And Governor Bradford abolished socialism in that colony and brought God's rule, free enterprise, individual liberty to the people of that colony. That is when they began 
to succeed. The story is the same in Jamestown. It was called the starving time before they came to a realization of their dependence on God and God's system of society. Sadly, it was a lesson that we're still learning and people around the world have been learning. The people of Russia had to learn it all over again for 80 years and, and they're still learning it. They still haven't abandoned it. Uh, I remember one statement that what was produced on 10% of the land could not be produced on 90% of the land under the seven-year plan. Think about those numbers for a second. Yes, America is a bountiful land. You know, I, I love the old Russian joke, by the way. I had a, had a Russian defector I went around the country with. He used to say, when they, when they asked us about the system, the economic system in Russia, we used to say, yes, we have a system. The people pretend to work, and the government pretends to pay us. <laughs> yes, America is bounteous, but the source of that bounty and the good fortune for which we annually give thanks and hopefully more than annually, lies not merely in the fertility of the soil or the frequency of the rains. There's no more fertile breadbasket on earth than the Ukraine. It's the system that God ordained and the thankfulness for that system and with which we serve Him. That's to worship Him and Him alone, to work diligently with our hands and labor, to organize ourselves under the biblical system of free enterprise, individual liberty, and reward for labor. It's when we obey God that God blesses. It's not lip service. Today we've forgotten not only the God to whom we should be thankful for the many blessings of this nation, we sit by idly and let others incrementally put the same system in that failed so miserably at our beginnings. Although Thanksgiving is really a celebration of God's blessing on our nation, and this is still at heart a free country, we have lost sight of the operations of a society under the blessings of God. Biblical worship, hard work, free enterprise, Christian liberty and charity, and above all, thankfulness to our Creator. You know, it's a theme to be continued and to become stronger for over a century and then to be renewed in periodic revivals of faith over our country's history. This is not blasphemy. This is not anti-government. This is not uh, this has nothing to do with uh, the battle over the Ten Commandments on the courthouse wall, etc. Really, it has everything to do with the people themselves and their faith in this nation. And that's what built the strength of this nation. The New England Primer was the most widely used textbook in colonial America. It was first printed in 1690, not too long down the road from this. It was well used into the 19th century, still used today by some people, homeschoolers like my, my family and myself. Many of the founders learned from it in their childhood. Here's an excerpt. A divine song of praise to God for a child. This is a recitation by the Reverend Dr. Watts. How glorious is our heavenly king who reigns above the sky. How shall a child presume to sing his dreadful majesty? How great his power is none can tell, nor think how large his grace, nor men below, nor saints that dwell on high before his face. That's a school lesson, folks. The next lesson is a lesson for children in the same book. This is what it calls for. This is, this is, an, this is a, a, an imperative. Pray to God. Try that in a public school today. Pray to God. Call no ill names. Love God. Use no ill words. Fear God. Tell no lies. Serve God. How far we've moved. Turkey Day? August 20th, 1778, Commander-in-Chief George Washington referring to recent instances of divine intervention during the War for Independence. He wrote to Brigadier General Nathaniel Green, the, the hero of several different battles. They were good friends. And this is what he said. This is George Washington. President, first two terms. The hand of providence has been conspicuous in all this, that he must be worse than an infidel that lacks faith and more than wicked that has not gratitude enough to acknowledge his obligations. But it will be time enough for me to turn preacher when my present appointment ceases, and therefore I shall add no more on the doctrine of providence. That's thankfulness. 
There's a man of God, the most significant military man in our history, one of the most significant political leaders of the day, one of the most astute. He predicted the problems with, with partisan politics. He predicted the Civil War 100 years before it happened, nearly, about 70, 70 years before it happened. He predicted the Civil War. Absolutely brilliant. He kept his peace to a large degree on his faith in the course of his leadership, yet here it is. Dr deny it, Russell means. Okay? Deny what our country was, was based on. Rather than an exclusionary religion, it, it was a haven for others. And this is what Russell means and many other people who, who are in the atheist or leftist camp miss. To make it even more clear, long before the revolution, one of the most recognizable figures in our history. How many, how many people recognize, give me liberty or give me death? Okay? This is a recognizable statement, right? Patrick Henry said, It cannot be emphasized too strongly or too often that this great nation was founded not by religionists, but by Christians. Not by religions, but on the gospel of Jesus Christ. For this very reason, peoples of other faiths have been afforded asylum, prosperity, and freedom of worship here. Excuse me, Mr. Obama, but I cannot equate that with this is not a Christian nation. Sorry, I get a little <laughs> agitated about that subject. George Washington's 1789 Thanksgiving Proclamation. That's what it's titled. You'll have a copy of it here they'll hand out to you. I'm just going to read a little piece of it because you're going to get a copy of it. Uh, after the initial things there, uh, signal favors of Almighty God, especially affording them an opportunity peaceably to form a government for their safety and happiness, talking about the Constitution. Now, therefore, I do recommend and assign Thursday, the 26th day of November next, to be devoted by the people of these states to the service of that great and glorious being, capitalized, who is the beneficent author of all the good that was, that is, or that will be, that we may then all unite in rendering unto him our sincere and humble thanks for his care and protection of the people of this country previous to their becoming a nation for the signal and manifold mercies and favorable, favorable interpositions of his providence in the course of this country becoming to their becoming a nation. For the signal, oh, I'm sorry, interpositions of his providence in the course and conclusion of the late war, for the great degree of tranquility, union, and plenty which we have since enjoyed, for the peaceable and rational manner in which we have happiness, particularly the national one now lately instituted for the civil and religious liberty with which we are blessed. And it goes on. This is a wonderful document. It's, a, it's an incredible document. But it, is, it makes so moot the point that, that government agents try to make today that we're not a Christian country, that we can't have Christian influence, that we can't have Christian icons or, or Christian language or Christian uh, behavior, prayer, the Ten Commandments, biblical references in, in our government system. This is George Washington. Now, a side note, shortly after this proclamation was written, it was lost for 130 years. The original document was written in longhand by William Jackson, secretary to George Washington. It was signed by George Washington. It was probably misplaced or put in some private papers when the capital was moved from New York to Washington. The original manuscript wasn't placed in the National Archives until 1921 where, when a guy by the name of Dr. J.C. Fitzpatrick was an assistant chief of the manuscript division of the Library of Congress, happened to find the proclamation at an auction sale being held at an art gallery in New York. What are the odds? Okay, what are the odds? He purchased the document for $300, gave it to the Library of Congress in which it now resides. It doesn't stop. Then there's George Washington's statement about the nation. Okay, listen carefully to this one and repeat this, please. Get a hold of a copy of this. Repeat this to your congressmen, your senators, your elected representatives. The next time they tell you, well, you know, we've got to separate church and state. Here's what George Washington said, quote, It is the duty of all nations to acknowledge the providence of Almighty God to obey his will, to be grateful for his benefits, and humbly to implore his protection and favor. Sound like separation of church and state to you? And again, I have a hard time equating that with Obama's statement that America is not a Christian nation. Thanksgiving is America, indeed. It, it, it is part and parcel of thankfulness to God for our, our history, our wonderful American history. It's part of our fabric, not in, just on Thanksgiving, but all year round. And in everything we do, this Thanksgiving, 
I, 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 I encourage you to think about what you're participating in at Thanksgiving. If, if you have a lot of company over, as my family and I often do, um, I think the record so far is 54 we've had in our house for a, a Thanksgiving. Or, well, I have seven children. Three of my best friends have seven or six children. And a lot of them are adult now and they have their own children. So, you know, when we invite a few friends over, it can get uh, out of hand. But we really enjoy it. And it's great. And the fellowship is wonderful. And, and the, the uh, enjoyment of the day, the liberty. You know, you think about how many people in this country have a holiday for Thanksgiving and have no idea why they have a holiday or what that holiday is really for. Harken back to George Washington's proclamation. What is our duty on Thanksgiving? It's certainly not to watch the Cowboys. I, you know, I'm a football fan, not as much as I used to be. It's fading with years and busyness, but that's not our duty. A large turkey is not our duty. Even family and friends gathering together, as nice as that is, that's not our duty. Our duty is to give thanks to the Creator that created us, our nation, everything in it. I believe created the government that we now that we live under, although albeit you know under duress, the Constitution is under it's being assailed on a daily basis. But that very government and this very nation and the foundations of it were built upon the graciousness and the blessings of God. And for that, we have set aside a day that we still celebrate. I anticipate there'll be a challenge to that one day, just like to the National Day of Prayer. But we still celebrate the gift of God, the blessings of God on our nation. Thanksgiving is the name of the holiday. I, you know, I challenge you, the next time somebody labels it Turkey Day or gives, gives it some other nomenclature, just like my other pet peeve, season's greetings, okay? I stop people in their tracks. I say, whoa, 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 excuse me. Christmas, we're talking about Christmas, the birth of Christ. It's not about Christmas trees. It's not about, you know, I, all those traditions are fine. We, we do lots of those things in stockings, and that's all fine. And you do what you want in that, in that area. That's up to your, that's soul liberty. See, that? You, you can do what you want with that. But let's not forget the reason that we celebrate Thanksgiving. Let's not forget the reason that we celebrate Christmas. And let's not forget the foundation the underpinnings of America. That's why we're blessed. That's the sole reason that we've been blessed beyond any nation on earth. It's not natural resources. Take a look around. Africa, huge continent, full of natural resources. Enormous, enormous wealth in the ground. Diamonds, uh, uranium, um, trees, wood, water, you know, all the resources you can imagine in Africa. And yet, look at, look at what has happened to the nations of Africa over the years. Look, look at the problems they've had. When they had Christian-based governments in some areas, they thrived. And there were some economies that were some, among the top ten economies in the world. When they gave that up and they were taken over by socialism or communism or some other ism of, of, of different stripes, what happened to their economies? What happened to their lives? I, I see statistics where now they have uh, crime a 2,400% increase in crime in Durban, South Africa under the new Mandela, I'm sorry, communist government. Think about the blessings we have and think about the other side of that. Our existence, our nation, the salvation of our very souls. If you believe that Thanksgiving in America is indeed part and part of, parcel of the, our thankfulness to America, if you believe that we need to be thankful to the God that gave us this great nation, then when you go home for Thanksgiving, let's remember to thank God for the blessings that we've received. And I think we, we might educate ourselves a little bit about some of the economic and political and, and other ramifications in our early days with forgetting the system and the social system and the economic system that God describes and set up in his in his word as well because that's the system that our founders gave us and monkeying with it the way that we're monkeying with it today and accepting socialism in any way shape or form accepting the erosion of private property accepting the erosion of our right to worship 
And if you believe that you can just be patriotic and that that's going to weather the storm, I have news for you. And I have a little story for you that I'm going to close with. 11-year-old boy for two weeks prior to Veterans Day put an American flag on the back of his bicycle and rode his bicycle to school each day. Now, they're, they're not allowed to bring bicycles on the school grounds. The school property ha has banned bicycles. They can't bring them out there. So there's public property with bike racks in front of the school, and they can park their bikes there and lock them or whatever they do and leave their bikes there for the day and then come back to their bikes in the afternoon. But they're not allowed to bring the bikes on the school grounds. So this is on public property on a public street. Two weeks, the boy has been riding with his flag. Veterans Day, he arrives at school with a, an 11 by 15 American flag on a little wooden pole attached to the back of his bike. And the school authorities came out of the school grounds onto the public property at the bike rack and told him to take his flag off his bike, fold it up, and stick it in his backpack because it might offend some of the illegal aliens and other nationalities on the school grounds by its very presence. That's our American flag, the Stars and Stripes, folks. I am not lying to you. Go to the web, look it up. It happened. That's the extent of the assault on our rights. That's the extent of the assault on our country. And that flag, to me, symbolizes all the things we've talked about here today. They've reversed it, yeah, you bet they reversed it. They're, they've, they've gotten more email in one, in one week than they've gotten in the entire history of the school. <coughs> Pardon me. There's also a movement afoot, and I, and I thought this was kind of humorous, a movement afoot in response to that, where a group has gotten together and they've decided to fund, through donations and through their own machinations, they formed a group to fund the purchase of one million American flags to be delivered to that school. <laughs> Okay, yeah, it might not be the best use of the money, but uh, as long as they don't buy them in China, okay? You know, I, I, think, I think it might send a message. Well, folks, this is, this is the reason that any erosion of this package, and it is a package, free enterprise, individual liberty, freedom of religion, freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, like we have here today, all of these things and the thanksgiving that we owe to the Creator who gave us those blessings are all part of the package. We can't allow any of them to be eroded. And we have to remember them. We have to remember those foundations because without the foundations, if the foundations crumble, the building collapses. And that's what we saw in 1620 and 1621, 1622 in, in the Pilgrim colonies. They, they, there were godly people there that were giving thanks for their survival, but their, their prosperity, their plenty, did not start until they reinstituted God's systems across the board. Thank you very much.